How's it going, everybody? Welcome back to the STD podcast. It has been a minute since I've uh, done a podcast with the boys and uh, currently waiting shimmy. I have him uh, the link sent over to him, so hopefully we can get him to join us. But um, I have Trevor today. Trevor is in a new space, uh, all moved. He was gone for a few weeks, so setup looks nice. Thank you. Uh, yeah, super, super stoked. It's nice to have your own space and whatnot. Right, right. And it's like, I can imagine when I switched over to like having an office, it's just having your designated workspace like feels so nice. Oh my God. Yeah. I could never go back now. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. And, and you'll, it'll find it, you'll find it uh, interesting when you travel too. Cause I, when I come back home after traveling, I'm like, man, I'm so grateful I have this like space where I work. Cause when you're trying to work, you know, on the go you're at an airport you're like at a hotel or something like that it's just like it's just not the same as when you're in your office working without distractions right yeah so that's cool um today we're going to talk a little bit so actually um the reason why we didn't record last week is i got sick um i had salmonella which was really fun um but uh trevor and i were going to talk a little bit about um deloading and 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 how do you approach well not just deloading but how do you approach an illness um, and then coming, coming off of an illness. Um, so, so what do you do with your training your nutrition? Um, should you deload? Should you not deload all that stuff? So, uh, Trevor, kind of what's your experience with, um, with illness around training, I guess. Uh, I mean, I, I guess I'm lucky that I very rarely get sick. Um, but in December I had kind of a same thing. I think I was in week three of a mesocycle. And I got strep. Uh, so, you know, fever, unable to move, unable to eat for, God, I didn't, I was talking to you and Jimmy about it. I think I was like, didn't eat more than like yogurt for like a week. Yeah. Yeah. I remember you saying you were, you were doing the tub, tub of Greek yogurt. Yeah. This is like all I could eat. And I mean, there was like two days there where I didn't even eat anything at all. Uh, so, you know, obviously that happens, you know, right in the middle of a um, training cycle. It never kind of, happens uh, like. For, yeah, it, it's never like right at the perfect time, you know, when you like the, after you do your last training session of the mesocycle, you get sick and you're sick. <laughs> but it's always like right, smack dab in the middle, like right, right in the middle of week three or week four when you're like really getting to the good stuff. Yeah, that's exactly what it was for me. I was like at second i did i did my second day of training in week four so like yeah. my last week and i was like so stoked because i was like this is like really getting hard like but it's funny because i felt the onset of the illness and i'm like man i'm just like carrying a lot of like everything's aching like i was like i'm just really fatigued this week it's really yeah, weird same thing happens to me i'm like god like, what the hell is with this doms like yeah this, i never felt anything like this and then like six hours later i have like 102 fever i'm like that explains uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah because i thought it was like because you definitely pushed my volumes especially in that last week so i'm like i was like man I'm, I'm really feeling the extra volume today like this is weird right but all of a sudden i'm really sick i'm like oh maybe it was the volume to some degree but it probably is also well, the illness and that's definitely a thing to keep in mind too and that's why i that's why you everyone has that experience of oh yeah. i get sick in you know at the end of week three or the beginning of week four i never get sick in week one you know, your immune system is hampered from hard training and from exactly. stress and from accumulating fatigue. And that's another reason why you can't just train hard all the time. It's your immune system is getting hampered. So if you train hard all the time, you know, it's a saying, if you don't deload, your body will deload for you. It's not always just injury. It can yeah. be just you get sick and right. you have to take four or five days off because you're sick. Oh, well, it's just, it's the same reason. It's because of accumulated fatigue. Yeah, yeah. Experience in in my experience, that's usually when I get sick is like those latter yeah. weeks. And it's funny because when I used to train chronically harder, I used to get sick a lot more frequently. I remember, yeah. I remember like trying the failure training every set, and uh, I remember. I mean, I I knew I was carrying a lot of fatigue. I used to like get, I used to get. Either I would feel ill from the actual fatigue that I was carrying, or I would like have a compromised immune system and when i would get sick i'd get really sick and i remember a few months when i was training with very high volumes probably not like close to actual like volitional failure in the muscle but like doing that kind of like bullshit where you're like just 
taxing your CNS and everything else, right? Jared Fe- Feather's favorite thing ever. Yeah, exactly. And uh, that's, I would just, man, I remember like a few times I was like, man, I thought like I was being healthy doing all this like, you know, training, but I think I'm really just screwing myself up. Yeah, right. Um. So this week I, the so last week I was sick. I didn't eat for like three days, lost like 10 pounds. Uh, probably a good chunk of that was water retention because <laughs> I'm back to eating at maintenance now and my, my weight's kind of just staying the same. So it was probably just from the actual amount of growth hormone that I had in my system. <laughs> but <laughs> but um i i didn't eat for three days right and it's funny because um it's like i felt that fatigue that i feel in contest prep like when i'm like having a hard time getting up my stairs and i just forget what it's like when you're because we're so used to being being uh appropriately um like eh, having enough nutrition right on average right. especially in the off season like you don't it's foreign right. to feel like feel feel like what it feels like to have inadequate nutrition with hard training and I remember like, I was getting up my stairs and I was like, man, this like, w- that took a lot of effort. And um, so in that, in that is, in itself, I was like, it's probably not a good idea to train. Right. Cause I, even then I was feeling better towards the weekend. I was like, maybe I could train. And, you know, I, I think this probably happens to a lot of people, especially people who enjoy training is like, you want to get in and you want to go after it. Mm-hmm. But then we deloaded this week. Right. And uh, maybe you could speak to that a little bit about like, needing to deload after you're ill, right? You don't just like, you're, you're not necessarily like, yeah, your training volume is going down when you're sick and you're not training. So you get some, probably some actual like joint and connective tissue, uh, fatigue, fatigue reduction. But at the same time, I mean, those joints and, and structures being able to recover probably also requires the, uh, raw materials that are being used to fight off the illness, uh, in a lot of cases, or at least energy, right? Uh, but maybe you could talk a little bit about needing to deload after being ill. Yeah, for sure. And I would say it depends. Um, so you can kind of look at it and spread it out in different ways. So if we're talking like, oh, uh, you have a head cold or whatever, and you're talking like a couple of days being sick, you probably don't need a full deload. But when you go back to training, you need a few days of reduced volume and reduced intensity. Now, in your situation where, I mean, it was nearly a week you were sick. Yeah. And you have an inability to eat on top of that. Then you can't just say, okay, well, I did this. So uh, I'm just going to, you know, even just saying, well, I'll just start my next mezzo now. Because your next mezzo is still hard training. You're starting a mezzo with hard training. And so if you especially have that, you need some time to recover because yes, some fatigue is going to come down. Certain certain body systems fatigue will come down. Obviously, joint and connective tissue fatigue lowers. But if you're not eating, your substrates aren't ever getting refilled. And that's a huge component of reducing fatigue. Um, central nervous system recovery, being able to have sen- you know, a high level of central drive, glycogen stores for simple fueling muscle contractions, things like that. You know, so if you're coming off, you know, four or five days, not being able to eat, keep food down, you know, you, you will also have dehydration issues. And if you've ever been dehydrated, it's not as simple as like, oh, I'm just going to drink water today and I'm going to hydrate again. It takes you, unless you're doing like some really rapid uh, rehydration strategies, which then introduces a whole other aspect of potentially kind of fucking up uh, electrolytes balances right and, you know um it takes time to rebalance your electrolytes it's not just an immediate thing you can do and so you have all of these different mechanisms that you have to have a little bit of time post sickness to be able to recover from so if you say well i'm just going to you know all right yeah i i missed my last week of training most of the last week because i was sick and i didn't train so i'm just going to start my next meso right, right away you're going to go into that meso you're not going to be a hundred percent. You're not going to be able to push as hard as you want to. And if you do, you're going to already have a higher level of fatigue. So now you run the risk of, okay, well now I'm going to cut my mesocycle short because instead of coming in, you know, with whatever, you know, 20% fatigue, I come in with 35% fatigue. And that compounds, you know, that's why we, 
that's why it's not just a deload every uh, mesocycle either is we compound fatigue over blocks and a deload generally isn't enough to completely wash away fatigue it's washing away most of it but you know maybe after meso one you come back with 20 percent fatigue then 30 percent fatigue so on and so forth and that's when we need an active rest or a low volume phase things like that to really wash away fatigue and really clean the slate so you can't just say you know oh i was sick i had a few days off of training that's good enough i'm gonna go not if you're really really serious about this does that make sense yeah yeah 100 it sucks but it's the reality of it <laughs> yeah and you know i get it we all love to train all right, well, the people watching watching us, I assume, Probably. love to train. Otherwise, why the hell are you watching a fitness podcast? It's kind of weird, <laughs> um, you know. But you have you have to look at the long game too, and it it can be hard. Um, it can be hard to take that step back and say, "Okay, I understand what I need to do," and actually do it. Because, like yeah. you mentioned to me before we started recording, you're like. I was ready to train. I had the drive to train. You know, I felt I was eating again. I could keep food down and whatnot. But I just basing how you felt, you know, after you just started eating again, how effective do you think, think training would have been? Yeah. Not, not very effective. Yeah. It would have been subpar. Right. And in, in my, in my opinion, there's no reason to have subpar training. You either have effective training or recovery training. You're wasting your time. Or what are you doing? Yeah. You know, if you're if you're serious about this, if your goal is to be a serious athlete about this, do you have effective training or recovery training? And that middle ground is not doing anything except adding more fatigue. So if you're going to say, well, I'm just going to accept that middle ground, why? Recover and get back to effective training sooner. Yeah, I was thinking about this actually as I pulled up to the gym today. I was like, every like three to four weeks, I am not training. And I don't see the gym every day. And that's like weird. And then I think about, I was thinking about like, what do, what would other people think of that? Like all these like hardcore lifters, they'd be like, that's really weird. Like, why would you not train every four weeks? Like you train, you train until you get injured or something like that, until you can't handle it anymore, right? Or you Or you deload it even, I think some of them who are still kind of like leaning towards that, like, uh, periodization, right? They they may deload every like eight to ten weeks, right? And um, I really, I think I think, but what you said there about like, you know, I'm in the gym to make progress. Uh, I really kind of have to stand alone in that regard and be like, no, like this is supportive of my goals. I would love to train still. I'd love to just not take breaks, but one that they serve physiological and also psychological relief. Uh, to allow me to continue to train at my max capacity. Like I can't imagine hitting that amount of volume for that period of time, that close to failure and being able to bring it every day. Yeah. And I think some people claim they can, and maybe there are a few people who can. Uh, but I think with, at the volumes, especially that we're training at, that we're using with the, you know, relatively close to, if not failure in the, in the last week, um, it's, it's 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 hard to sustain that for a long period of time um and fatigue also would mask that over time too right <laughs> you think you're training at a zero rir but you're like just really so messed up that it may it may be actually a few reps in the tank right yeah and that's the thing that's the thing that people don't consider as fatigue accumulates your perception of effort changes yeah and what may feel like a zero rir and may in that singular instance be a zero RAR is only such because your fatigue is so high, it is masking your ability to, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Express your fitness. Yeah. 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 Cause I mean, do you think about it? We are, uh, the bigger picture is like every time you're training, like throughout a mesocycle, we aren't expressing our max fitness level, right? Hmm. Because yeah. we are always carrying some level of fatigue, but that probably lessens over time. As you accumulate more fatigue, you're expressing yeah. even less and less of your fitness. And a deload is an opportunity 
to allow some of that fatigue to drop off. Like you said earlier, not all of it, because you need an actual active rest or maintenance phase to do that, but allow some of that fatigue to drop off so you can continue expressing, uh, you know, a baseline level of performance uh, mm -hmm. that you can carry throughout a mesocycle and yep. you know, finish the mesocycle appropriately. So, uh, yeah, interesting. Just like uh, on that same train of thought, you know, people ask, well, okay, I did, I did one mesocycle here. What do I do for weights? Do I, if I'm just keeping the same exercises, how do I pick weights? Well, and that's why it's like, okay, well, you know, say you started at 200 pounds week one, um, you know, week two, you did 210. Well, maybe meso two, you started at 210. Yeah. Because your fitness has increased and now your fatigue has dropped off. So you can start to express that fitness. And every mesocycle is just another step on that ladder. So you're saying once that, like that week one, once week one and two, you're carrying low levels of fatigue. So that's what the, that's the number you should probably pick for the. So uh, ex explaining that is like, so week one, your fitness levels are that, that you can do 200 pounds for three reps in reserve. Mm -hmm. As you continue on, your your fitness will rise, but your fatigue rises at a more exponential rate. Mm -hmm. And that's when you start getting that crossover of fitness and fatigue. So your as that fitness is going up, eventually we, you know, that fatigue hits where we can no longer express our fitness levels. But fatigue also drops quicker than fitness. So now in mesocycle two, our fitness is at such a point that 210 pounds is now our three rep, three reps in reserve low. Right, right. That makes sense. Because that fitness level is higher at the start of the next next cycle. Yeah. But because we've allowed that fatigue to drop, whereas if we tried to, um, you know, perhaps do that 210 at our max fatigue level, it might be two or one RAR. Right. Because our fatigue levels are so much higher. Or pulling like a low to use from like week four or five, like your last week and using that as a baseline. Yeah. Right? That's also probably not great. So that's, that's, you know, that when you were saying that, it just made me, it, it gave me the picture in my head of that's exactly how you're structuring a mesocycle. You know, your fitness and fatigue are going up like this, but your fatigue is dropping as you're going through that. That's how you design a block. That's how you progress over a block. Right. It's really the average weight is going up. Because I had a I had a client ask me that once because he was like, well, if I don't use the weights that I used in like the last week on my first week, how am I getting stronger? And I'm like, look at the average amount of weight that you're using with that that movement across multiple mesocycles, right? Yeah. The average has gone up like 10 pounds consistently or whatever, right? So yeah, and, you're like, com yes. and you compare like for like. Right. Is your week one weight going up? Is your week two weight going up? Three weight going up? Four weight going up? Right, right. Because if you're comparing week five to week one, right? Yeah, you're using entirely different effort scales. Right, right. Yeah. that And that was, um, I think when I read um, How Much Should I Train, that was explained and illustrated to me a little bit more. Because that was also a weird thing for me to grasp. Because I'm like, well, we're already tra if we're always training with like a, a certain level of reps in reserve, then like you know, I don't know how, how was I thinking about it then? I was thinking about it in a weird way where I was like, for some reason thinking like in terms of like my zero RAR as my like max strength um, yeah. metric. And then I was like, well, if my zero RAR weight is like, you know, I'm not starting that mesocycle. So I guess it was probably the same rationale that he was using is like, if I'm not starting that meso with my top end performance. It, uh, then that, why yeah, top yeah, it is if you've used a weight, you can never go lower. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's probably what it was. It's like, well, I'm not progressing if I use less weight now. Right. That but makes you're a ton progressing of if your effort levels are matched. Matched, yes. That's that's a key. That's oh, that's yeah. really awesome. That's what it that's what that look at like for like. Yep. How much weight are you using for X, Y, and Z effort level? Right. That X should be going up. Y should be going up. Z should be going up. Yeah. Another great analogy, another fitness one is um like I don't compare my peak off season photos to my contest prep photos. Yeah. 
I would par- compare peak off season to peak off season because if I look at my contest pro, pro photos, I'm just going to get depressed because I'm yeah, like, you're like oh, this wow, way fatter. <laughs> exactly. Right. So that's exactly, that makes a ton of sense. If you look at it, you think about it in those terms. Yeah. Uh, so that was I was an offshoot of the, the initial topic of sicknesses and how to handle sicknesses and deloads and stuff like that. But it just, yeah, that- yeah, no, I think that was super cool. Uh, is there anything else we should say about illness? So we, we talked about like the need for a deload after an illness. Oh, you talked about, I think, or I think you mentioned depending on the level of illness and one, one reference point I've heard, um, it's, it's probably a little bit more individual than this, like depending on the illness, but like, you know, um, above your head, uh, you shouldn't go to the gym and below your head. And I know that I also, I'm not really the biggest fan because I think it also just oversimplifies like could have like two broken legs and be like yeah no i'm still good to do squats today like you know what i mean but below below the neck generally speaking you may be able to still go to the gym uh I don't, is it that or is it the other way if it's above your but neck above you can train if it's neck below you shouldn't yeah, yeah it's probably the other way i don't know regardless why I, I that's a fairly good metric um and honestly if you the thing is is it come you can simplify this whole thing if you go into the gym and you you start warming up to do your your workout, and you're supposed to do, you know, last week you did 195 for 10. This week you're supposed to do 200 for 10, and you throw on 195 for your last warm up, and you struggle to grind out one rep. Leave the gym. <laughs> you know, yeah. I, if if your workout turns to a shit show, just leave the gym. Right. That'll just make you more upset and probably not benefit your illness. Again, it goes back to you're just having subpar training at that point. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. You want effective training or recovery training. Subpar yeah. training is giving you no benefit. That's um. That's gonna be a really hard thing to walk away from too. Like, oh, dude, I I it is taking me years, and I still struggle with it. Sometimes yeah, yeah. I'm still sitting there rationalizing in my head. Well. I know I'm like five reps under what I should be hitting, but right. Could I? Could I, I know, add, could I add sets to match the volume? Yeah, I've I've done that. I've literally done that before. I've had I've had clients ask me that. I've done it myself before. <laughs> um, and, but the thing I have found is that long term progress, especially, is simply better if you have that metric of. So you have effective training and you have recovery training and subpar training gets you nowhere. Yeah. And if you're accepting subpar training, you're accepting less results. Right. And this is especially too for like competitors who like do this at higher levels too. It's funny because they do the opposite where they accept subpar training and labeled as, as I'm a badass, nothing can stop me, which is just hilarious when you think about it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a whole other topic I could get on. But, yeah. yeah, genetics right. and drugs can go a long ways. What was that? Genetics and drugs can go a long ways. Oh, one hundred percent, and a motivational caption on your Instagram post. Yeah, right. <laughs> oh, what was I going to say on that? That was totally not on what was on the topic, but um, we were saying that. Uh, you you, you had asked me about like above or below the head, above the neck, um, uh, and- head something about um uh, the kind of the length of the sickness can help vary about what you need to do recovery wise i don't know i totally lost it well i can quickly run over that so um generally you can look at it as if if you're sick for a couple of days you probably can take like if if you're sick day one two three you're feeling better but not quite ready for the gym Day four, five, six, you can probably do a recovery workout. And then you have an off day. And during that time, you're eating in maintenance or even a slight surplus. And then kind of get back to training. But say you got sick in week three. You don't go to week four. You repeat week three. You repeat that volume. You repeat that RAR. You don't try to progress from there. Because essentially, you just didn't do week three. That's in the context of you missed like half the week. Is that what you're saying? That's yeah. You missed two, maybe three days. Okay. If you're getting past that, if you're getting to four or five days of actual sick, like you're sick, you need time to recover after that. Yeah. That was my situation. 
so at that point it's like okay at that point just take a full deload really rinse the plate yep cool so that's a good framework to work within too because then it's like okay you know maybe if you're only sick for a few days it's really not a whole lot of time lost you come back in do uh what would you say is in terms of volume in in your easy sessions like what would you start what would you ease back into typical like sort of deload deload paradigm basically like half like half volume half the volume half the volume maybe 75 percent of the load okay so relative effort is is reduced in that part of the week back yeah and then next week you go to kind of plan progression would you actually since you had a little bit of fatigue reduction do you uh like do you do anything with the sets there or you just kind of plan progression um i i will auto regulate i will go in with the plan of being whatever that week was but there may be some auto regulation where you pull a set back but i would never add a set okay okay never add a set from once you're back to normal training after being sick if you're going back and restarting week three I would not add sets above what week three already was. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Potentially pull back because you may, may have gotten a little bit of resensitization. Right. But there's, if you jump ahead, you're basically going from the last effective training you had was, you know, week two's volume loads and uh, effort levels. And now you're going to jump to what week four. Right. right. That could be a large difference. And you're kind of just shooting in the dark too, as far as your progressions. If you're like, I'm going to go off of, uh, you know, plan progressions from week three. It's like, well, week three, you don't have very much data to use to plan progression anyway. Right. What instead of doing a 10 pound jump on, uh, you know, leg pressure and do a 20 pound jump. Right. You're going to assume, assume that you somehow are stronger and didn't have any regression of performance or being sick at that after being sick. Exactly. Yeah. That's 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 funny. That makes a lot of sense, though. Yeah. Um, actually, I wanted to talk a little bit. So you've been programming for me. Um, I'm actually. I wonder if if our listeners may be curious too. Like, you know, I'm. I, I've I've seen like you have some big clients too. But like, are there any uh, differences you've noticed with programming for me as opposed to like your your average client in terms of like programming? I don't know how you are dead, basically. <laughs> um you uh definitely your volume tolerances are especially for someone your strength level and size your volume your volume tolerances are kind of scary to me <laughs> they're scary to me too so and i'm, I'm like not alone. there's no way he's gonna do this and then you do it and you're like yeah i was a little sore for like 12 hours and then i was fine yeah i recovered like two days before i had to train that muscle again I'm just like, okay, so we're going to add more volume. And until that last week that, you know, you had a couple sprinkles throughout the the mesocycle, but mostly until that last week, you were still progressing. Yeah. Yeah. You were hitting your, you know, rep targets with your load targets every single time. It was. And and improving technique based on some of the suggestions that you had made too. Yeah, it was it was it was quite impressive. Um, <laughs> I will definitely say though, um, I, I, you're not the most, um, just because you know there there are some like smaller female clients that it's just like you, you should be broken in half by this point, but somehow right. not. So I guess we're gonna keep going. Um, but you're definitely on the higher end of what I experience have experienced, and it was uh, a little bit shocking to be honest. Yeah, I'm really excited to see what we do this upcoming mesocycle because we didn't even get to do that last week. Yeah. The only thing I, I did get, my biceps got sore. And I told you that was the first week where I got a three out of three yeah. pump on my biceps as well. And my biceps actually got sore the next day. And yeah. they were getting some. That was like the only thing. It was just those, um the the Bayesian or the behind the back rolls, especially when we made that tweak just to kind of keep them back. Uh, that yeah. was like the best stimulus and soreness that I had gotten yeah. on anything. That was like yeah. the only soreness I'd gotten on anything though. Yeah, it is pretty crazy. So, um, yeah, uh, it just goes to show that, you know, volume tolerances are an individual thing. Yeah. You know, um, not everyone's going to have the same. And you can't just, you know, as a coach, 
when you're working with somebody, especially you know when you first start working with someone, you're going off of averages. But you got to be willing to adjust because I have yep. other clients who are they're significantly smaller than you. They're an average 20 something natural guy. And they're doing four to eight sets of any given body part and just barely recovering. Right. You know, yeah. so if I, if I gave you their program, you probably lose size at least in some areas and uh if i gave them your program well they would probably break in half and overtrain and probably never lift weights again end up with rhabdo and you know i'd get sued and that would not be fun <laughs> yeah um it's uh it is really interesting but it, it speaks to that as like even you know i i have i haven't had too many outliers like and i don't have I, I do have a lot of like strong bodybuilders with high recovery capacities for sure. Um, but I think even just seeing you not being afraid to just push the volume is something that I think I could do better by even see, by, by watch, by having you model that and be like, yeah. okay, like obviously like our metrics are there. You're not getting soreness. Your pump and disruption could probably be better. So let's add volume. Yeah. And your ability, you were just weren't, you weren't afraid of doing that. And you know, you, you added appropriately to my level of soreness, which was a lot of the time, nothing, which yeah. is like, yeah, you could add two to three sets on an exercise and probably be fine. Um, but yeah. I guess I, in the past I've been, I I'm, I'm very much more used to, and, and it's also because I've gotten more bigger, bigger competitors over time is I'm very much more used to the guy who's doing four to eight sets, maybe 10 on a muscle group. And it's just enough volume for him to recover. It's making progressions week to week. He's not being smashed completely, um, but you know I don't see that a whole lot. But it also speaks to your your experience and your expertise as well. And, and and again, not being afraid to just push things when they need to be pushed. Yeah, well, and this just you know as a coach, uh, you know, and as a as a client, there's a back and forth relationship. Right. As a coach, I rely on data, and as a client you have to be willing to give that data and honest with that data. And I'm sure you've seen it before and I've seen it before too, where people kind of fudge some things. And when you have a, a, a real talk with them, they're like, yeah, you know, I actually was kind of sore and, you know, my joints have really been aching lately and and this and that. And it's like, oh, well, I didn't know that. I was going off of the data I was given. Right. And I have to make the assumption as, as a coach, the data I'm given is given in honest faith. Yeah. So, you know, this kind of speaks to that, that coach client relationship of you have to have a, a good relationship as a client. You need to trust your coach to make the right decisions and you need to not be nervous uh, you know I, I think some of it maybe comes down to maybe people feel like they're not thinking i'm working hard enough so i i gotta i gotta show them i'm willing to work hard right I, I, i'll say from a coach's perspective trying to prove yourself to a coach prove that you're a hard worker isn't going to be helpful right the most helpful thing you can do is be honest yeah. And then as a coach, the best thing you can do is simply look at the data. You have to be unemotionalist. You have to be emotionless. Right. You have to be very subjective of this is what the data shows me. And this is what I have to base my recommendations off of. Yeah. Yeah. I think part of uh, originally what it was too for me was like, oh man, I would hate to make someone do this amount of volume. <laughs> And yeah. that was originally what it was. And I was like, no, no, like, this is what they pay me for. So like, I'm going to push them. Exactly. But it it's, was like, it's I was like, emotional yeah. side. Yeah. Yeah. Where you're like, oh man, that's a lot. I don't know. I, I don't feel good about this. And, you know, again, like you said, it's what they pay you for. 100%. And, you know, as you sh as a coach, you should encourage a line of discussion for them to be like, you know what? This is for various reasons, just too much for me. Right. I'm not willing to spend this much time in the gym. 
right. or if it's diet related, you know what? I'm not willing to deal with this hunger level and eat so little. Yeah. Or I'm not willing to be this bloated and eat this damn much. Yeah. You know, what's, that, what's that, that, that yeah. Yeah. Uh, open discourse needs to be there. And as the, as the coach, you just have to, you know, not have that emotion of, ah, oh, I wouldn't want to do that. That seems hard. Right. You know, yeah. and it's weird. It's weird. You know, and that's why I, as a coach, I am very big on like, I, I want to tell clients like, this is why we're doing this. If you have any questions, let me know. We can talk I'm about so. this. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I try to involve, involve my clients too. Like when I'm going to be like, okay, my, I have two options, either drop calories or increase activity. You'd be like, which one, like, are you more hungry or are you more tired? Right. Like ask them, yeah. you know what I mean? And get them involved in that decision-making process too. And yeah. um, what was I going to say on the last thing you said? Not on the account. Of, oh yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, I'm really, I'm, I'm not impressed when a client digs themselves into the ground, especially against my advice, I'm impressed when a client is like consistent mm -hmm. and communicates things to me Yeah, uh, that, that over time, I'm like, those are some of my best clients. And those yeah. are the clients who achieve results. Yeah. It's kind of funny every now and again, I'll get a client that be like, Oh, I'm sorry. You know, I just, I, I give you too much information. And I'm like, no, you give me useful information. Yeah. And it's better than having too little. Yeah. It's better than too having too little. It's better than me having to pry and ask. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And you, it, you, as a coach, you do kind of have to try to facilitate that the best you can. And, um, for me recently, it was, it was implementing a, a call every mesocycle at least, where I just kind of yeah. talk to them because again, over text, sometimes I lose some of that stuff. Um, but like, I think, you know, sh shooting them loom videos, explaining why you're doing something, yeah. you know, allowing and encouraging them to ask questions. And, and, and unfortunately, especially a lot of people that I've gotten, is um and I and I see this too with coaches is that they are discouraged from asking questions. They're discouraged from from questioning anything that the coach does. And so it's it's almost like you had a bad relationship, right? And you know, like someone was like abusive in a, in, in any manner, right? And then you go into a new yeah. relationship and you're you're have this expectation of, you know, or or you have this behavior that. that's learned. That's right. A bad thing to do. I okay, I'll just say it right now. If your coach tells you you're not allowed to question me or it doesn't matter. Just do what I say. Fire your coach. Yeah. That's amazing advice. Because that coach one, I'll say it probably doesn't know what they're doing. And that's why they're not willing to talk about it is because they don't know why they're doing something. Yeah. And they probably realize that, well, it works for me is a good enough answer for most people. So if your coach ever tells you you're not allowed to ask questions, that's a red flag. Yeah. I wish I knew that earlier. I really do. Yeah. Yeah. And I will say from the coach's perspective, um, you know, as a, as a coach, I, I'm completely okay with people asking me, why are you doing that? So, so da, 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 da. what can be frustrating as a coach is when it comes off as you aren't trusting the coach and you come back with, well, so-and-so said this, why are you making me do that? Yeah. That can definitely be frustrating for a coach. And if all of your questioning is like that, as a coach i think if i had a client that did that i haven't run into that yet i think if i had a client that did that i would actually know i have and i did tell them you know what i think it was a potential client it was an inquiry i said you know what i think that you're better off finding a different coach yeah because for me it wasn't worth the stress 100 percent so the, again, there's there's a mutual relationship with coaching and business. Right, right. Yeah, and I think that's really, you know, it's good that you did that and you didn't take that person on. And I think that, you know, if they're asking you like why so and so like a program, it's like we'll try so and so's program. Like if you if you're not really bought into the stuff that I have going on here, 
then you know it's it probably isn't a great fit in the first place like you probably yeah go you have to trust your team. one one thing that has always been a pet peeve of mine is um and you know i've seen it for years now following other other people in this space is that you know someone will, will go to a, you know a prolific coach and say so my my coach has me doing this do you think this is right what do you think i should do yeah man you're paying your coach for a reason you know you should talk to your coach right if you feel like you have to talk to somebody else you, you clearly don't trust your coach right and it's like why why are you with them just buy, yeah. you know you want to be able to trust that person you're paying you know good a good amount of money in a lot of cases to and more to than likely person. if you don't trust your coach you're probably not going to have the greatest adherence to the program. Yes, exactly. And you're probably you're not, not going to get you're not going to get the results that maybe you want to get. Right, because you're not bought into the process. You know, so um, just to kind of give the you know that other side of the spectrum is like it can go both ways. You you hear about bad coaches in the industry. You don't hear about it as much, but there are bad clients too. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that on, 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 that, on that level, if you're just chronically not trusting your coaches, it's something maybe you needs to be addressed personally before you even hire someone for that type of relationship, you know? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. One thing I will say, so like, what do you, what do you think is a, what's that? I don't even know how we got on this topic. <laughs> I don't either. I'm going to be honest with you. I ate an edible like an hour ago. So I'm just, gonna <laughs> just talking here. Um, uh, didn't expect it to hit me this hard. It was it's, I haven't been eating them that often, so it's like it's Friday, and then your guys is like, and then Jimmy's like, let's do a podcast, and then he ended up not showing up, right? <laughs> and I'm like, I'm chilling for the evening, whatever. Um, one thing I was gonna ask is, uh, what what do you think is a healthy amount of someone questioning their coach? You know what I mean? Like, when does it start to become like, okay, this is you know, like, because because I'll, I'll I'll I have some clients that do have data they do have stuff that um they are like like they are comfortable with doing a certain thing right or they they like a certain style right and i'm flexible as a coach because i'm like i really am just here to you know give them the service and i give them the, that the best i can if they have a couple contingencies or they like they have a couple preferences you know i will make them aware of the trade-offs but then I'll say, okay, well, that's fine if that's we prefer it. If you enjoy training more like this, um, you know, then then that's that's on you. That's your choice, right? I'm just here to give you the best results I can with the you know with the tools I'm given, right? Yeah. But at at some point, I I could imagine where it's like, okay, this isn't even my program anymore. What am I doing? You know, what level of like would you be willing to accept in that regard, and what do you think is appropriate? Well, one, I think it needs to come to the the mindset or the the heart of why someone's asking a question it, and and you can tell if you've been if you've been in a kind of like a customer service industry you kind of get used to you know you can read the read between the lines essentially right if it's a questioning because they're they're honestly wanting to learn They'll, they'll ask you a question and say, hey, I see that we're doing this. Why is it that we're doing that? And you give them an answer. And they're like, oh, okay, great. Um, and, and then that probably doesn't get brought up again because you've covered that. You've answered their question. You've allowed them to learn. If it's like that, I don't honestly see a problem with any amount of questioning somebody wants to do. Um, because I think as a, a coaching experience should also be a learning experience for a client. Right. 100%. I think that's how a client gets the best results. Um, and, and honestly, it improves it for the coach too, because as that person learns more, it honestly becomes, I, this, this is going to come off sounding kind of bad probably, but it becomes less work for the coach because you've invested first you've invested time and effort so that they don't need quite as much guidance going forward. Um, 
where it starts to become a a thing where I'm like, mm, okay, this is a red flag. We need to talk about this. Is if they're again they're coming at that with, well, so and so does this. So why do you do this? Why do you do that? And it's very you know kind of aggressive or combative questioning. Yeah, that's a red flag to me. If it, if the questioning is combative then there's automatically a, this level of trust not there right because they're they're not trusting my expertise and my knowledge they they're to me that's basically saying i think this person knows more than you why aren't you doing what they're doing right no why did you hire me um and then the other way, the other thing where I think that it throws up a red flag and there needs to be some discussions or some talks is if someone is asking you a question and you're giving them the answer and they're still just basically ignoring it. You know, if they're saying, um, well, why is it that, you know, why is, why is a cheat meal bad? And you tell them, you know, that this is why, this is the problems with cheat meals, da 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 and they say, oh, okay, that makes sense. Yeah, you know, maybe maybe it's best that I, you know, I kind of eliminate that. And they're still going out and, you know, cheating Friday night through Sunday afternoon. Right. Just blowing their diet up. Or you tell them, you know, they ask you, well, why are we doing X, Y, Z with training? And you tell them, you know, oh, okay. And then they just ignore the program and just go off every single week. They're going off the program over and over and over again. That's where it's like, okay, what's going on? You you know what another good example of this is? Is correcting someone's technique. And that's yes, a defensive. That's a really, really important one that I didn't even think about just now. But yeah, if uh, if if you as a coach, if you're giving someone um technique advice, and honestly, as a as a coach, if you're doing someone's training and you're never reviewing videos and never have any kind of technical like technique advice to give them like yeah um but if they're you know if you're giving that to them and they're well why should i do it that way and and or just saying ignoring you that's a red flag right right and and you know again you're hiring somebody you should be bought into the, the program you should be willing to learn from that person and if you're yeah. not then maybe that's not an appropriate relationship but i will say like some people it's it's also that maybe they have their ego tied up in the way they they, they, they perform things um, yeah i used to, i used to kind of walk on eggshells in that regard because i'm like maybe you know people don't like hearing this like and and what i do now is like it doesn't matter this is what they pay me for and i say i try to point out the good like not just to give them purely like you need to fix this and this i'm like your technique is actually good it improved from last week you know, look at, look at, look at all these things that you're doing and then, Hey, let's try to improve this thing for next week. Cause yep. it's really, cause you can also get caught up in the fact that I'm just constantly like, I mean, shit, my technique still needs correcting. Right. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. I've, I've been corrected, you know, hundreds of times I've corrected myself hundreds of times. So, you know, someone who's just like getting into this, especially, and they're new to some of these techniques, you know, it's, it's an endless process. It's a constant yeah. requires constant reevaluation. It requires constant tweaks. Their mobility is going to change over time. You know, the, the size of their muscles will change. Their actual, like, depending on what phase they're in, their, you know, their stomach, different leverages will change as well. And so it's something that requires that constant um, upkeep. So it, it can be really easy to be, like, just constantly telling somebody the things they need to fix on, on the coaching end. Like, just, you know, be cautious of just being, like, fix this, fix this, this. Try to give them benchmarks of like, look at, you know, or even like, you know, side by sides, like look at how low you were on the deadlift last month and then look at where you're at on the deadlift this month. You know what I mean? Yeah. They're just trying to remind them of that and then be like, and we can even do better, which is awesome. Yeah. You definitely want to, you know, the whole compliment sandwich sort of thing. If you do, right. if you're just constantly like, we need to fix X, Y, Z, we need to fix one, two, three. Yeah. And that's what every single time you're telling them it, after a while, it kind of feels like you're getting shot on. Right. You're like man, I'm trying really hard, but it's like, it, it, am I just always gonna suck? Can't do, yeah, I can't do right by my coach's eyes. Yeah, and so it's definitely like you know, again from the coaching side, it's like, you know, hey, you know, big improvements this week. You were you controlled it much better. 
but you know, there, there's these couple things here. So let's really focus on that this week. Right. Yeah. I try to be mindful too. Cause sometimes, you know, you have a client who's not a bodybuilder and they're just working from scratch, right? You're just like, just building them up. And it's like, you got to be really mindful of trying to build their confidence around yeah. their success, especially because their goals are going to be a lot smaller than this, this competitor, right? Yeah. They're, they need, they need to have smaller goals to be able to build that self-confidence, that self-efficacy to get over here. So you need to be the one cheering them on. Like, look, you, you know, you didn't have as much fast food this week. You brought some prepared food to work. Like that's awesome. That's yeah. so big. Um, but really trying to just hype them up. Like you, you also like just when your client does well, like just giving them the, the like good job, you know what I mean? Like, point because there's the good, wins. what was that? Point out the wins. Exactly. Cause it, uh, as, as myself, I'm very used to not pointing out my own wins. I'm just huh. like, all right, what's next? What's next? And it's yeah. like, well, like, look, like, look what you did. Good job. Like tell yourself good job. Yeah. And so I can imagine that is like that for other people too. So if you could be that person being like, look at how good you did, like, look like you lost, you know, a pound this week right and that's like you know they were weren't budging for a while like that's huge yeah and then keep that going right um it's it's always nice to have that because there's also going to come the time where you're you know they have a good week and then they have maybe a bad week in the future and it's like you're gonna have you you don't want to be the only conversation you're having with them is just like scolding them or like maybe i wouldn't even recommend scolding them in the first place but really like you know hey what what what, what happened here like you know what I mean? Like, let's fix this, this, and this. And it's like, yeah. oh shit, like that's all I'm hearing from my coach. Like I'm not doing good at all, whatever. Yeah. And understand that also as a coach, there are times when maybe someone is struggling and right. you need to have an honest conversation with them about reframing their goals. Right. You and, know, and I mean, obviously again, that's what they're paying you for. Right. You, you have to be there. You have to be the objective eye. Yeah. Yeah. And, and obviously, um, like I said, it's not really appropriate to scold them. And it, it's generally a, a conversation to be had mm -hmm. uh, when, when they're having trouble with adherence. Like I used to, I, I, when I first started, I would be like, Oh, like, you know, do better. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah. it's just, you think, I think about it now and I'm like, that's so silly. Like it's not, it's not as simple as that because yes. Well, and maybe it is. Sometimes it is. Sometimes it is. But most of the time, if someone isn't adhering, a lot a lot of the time, they're having tr trouble with it. You know, I've I've had my share of clients who just do not comply, and I can identify that, right? Uh, especially when they're not communicating with me. But if I'm getting communication, someone's speaking with me, they're like they're telling me everything, I can tell that that person is invested in this thing. Mm -hmm. um, but they're having trouble with a particular aspect. You know what I mean? Yep. And then being able to have a conversation around that and 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 actually fix that or work on that. And I think that's where. I think that the like coaching is, is definitely separated. Like I see a lot of coaches that are still like just nut up and do it. And I'm like, but like people are like, they're human. Like sometimes they, again, there are absolutely appropriate times to tell your clients to nut up and do it. Sometimes they need someone to just hold them accountable. Uh, but if that's something that's happening consistent, consistently, that's something that needs to be addressed. Mm -hmm. And it is addressed through having a conversation with them, figuring out what their triggers are, figuring out what they're specifically challenged with. Like, it, and even then, if it, it, I would generally never lead with that because of the fact that like, what if they have something that they're not telling you? Like, oh, my, my grandma died and I didn't train, like I wasn't training all this last week. That's why there's no data. And you're leading with what the hell are you doing? Like you didn't, you didn't comply this week. Like what the hell's wrong with you? You know what I mean? It's like shit, like you just didn't have the whole picture. So I would always say that it's always a smart idea to have a conversation. Yeah. When in doubt, just talk. Yeah. Right. Just talk. I mean, Ask and I think that, I think that speaks to like individuals, like relationships too. Like sometimes people in personal relationships don't just talk, right. They just lead with like their expectations yeah. of what the other person is doing. Right. Uh, yeah. Which is horrible. Right. You shouldn't have expectations for, you don't know what they're thinking, what's going through their head whatever. You know what I mean? So like, not having expectations and just having conversations. Yeah. Uh, I guess that's the theme. Just normalize having conversations. Yeah. Yeah. I, I guess uh, this whole seg segment could be uh, how to be a better coach and how to be a better client. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think that's really important. I try to talk about both of those two on this because I know that I have some people who are into coaching. Uh, I mean, like, like a lot of people in the team full ROM forum, I'm surprised like have clients and are, are coaches too. Uh, yeah. And, and so like 
you know, some of those people listen to this and then I think it, it, on average, you, you are also a client. A lot of those people are clients as well. So I think it yeah. speaks to both audiences uh, and we both are too, you know, I mean, like at least I'm a coach to you, right. Or I, you're a coach to me and, and then we are both coaches as well. So yeah, it's an interesting dynamic, but I think, um, if anything, we, 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 uh, we, I, at least I always learn from talking to you. So uh, I definitely in the same, I, I, one thing that I super appreciate about this kind of, you know, friendship and relationship that we've built is like, I have learned a ton. Likewise. And that's the great thing about this kind of this community and, you know, the whatnot is that we have the ability to, to you know, learn from so many people. Right. hundred percent. And I think that's another thing is where conversations are so important, like reaching out. Like, I think, you know, we built that relationship where we just kind of both just will shoot each other questions or like, you know, like, Hey, what, like I've, I've definitely checked, like ha checked myself on you before. I'm like, Hey, is what I'm thinking or what I'm doing rational here. I love having that as like a, you know, someone who might thinks, thinks like me, um, you know, where values align on a lot of levels too. It's like really cool to have someone else who's like, you know, we're just like neck and neck yeah. as far as that goes. So yeah, yeah man, I tell you, like, I, I definitely do appreciate it. Um, I think we started uh, talking about one thing and then talked about a million other things. So um, about right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, definitely. We should, well, hopefully we'll get shimmy on um, next week. And uh, I would love to continue the conversation about my training um, to some degree. I just wanted to touch on that a little bit more, <laughs> but yeah. I can't remember. We just went on some other tangent about coaching and stuff. So yeah, uh, I, I hope you guys, your next episode is going to be interesting. Yeah. I'm super excited. So yeah, maybe we'll talk about that next week. Yeah. Um, but yeah, man, it's, it's good to be back and it's good to be uh, chatting again. So uh, I'll let you get to your Friday night uh, right, relaxation. Man. Yep. Talk Thanks for coming on. Thanks for the conversation as always, man. Have a good night. Yeah.